Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Outside Shore Music, home of Mastering MuseScore. That is how I'm going to be saying that uh, until I come up with a better idea. But uh, welcome everyone, welcome to the MuseScore Cafe. Uh, this is my regular series. We talk about some aspect of making music using MuseScore. And uh, we have a particular theme we'll talk about uh, for, the, for the session. And the theme today is going to be a cleanup. That's how I'm going to put this. We're going to actually be revisiting this topic kind of on and off over the coming months because I really want, um, I really want to see us uh, collectively uh, helping create a nice body of scores on MuseScore.com. I mean, there's a huge body of scores there, but uh, making ones that are actually like accurate and well entered and will convert to Braille easily. That's one of my uh, kind of uh, hidden, not hidden agendas, uh, plain, plain out in the open agendas. So we're going to talk about what kinds of things make a score good, clean in that sense, and how to get your score into that state. Now, if you're entering it yourself and you do all the right things to begin with, it's already there. And so I often talk about the right way to do things and, and usually I'm demonstrating that. But what I want to do today is take some scores that are not clean, you know, ones that maybe someone else submitted, or in my case, one that I created many years ago, and kind of update it and clean it up and get it ready for, you know, other, where I can be proud for other people to really use this score and to feel like it has a reasonable chance of, of converting to Braille nicely. So, um, that's what uh, I'm kind of looking at today. And as I've uh, indicated, if you, uh, most of you here probably get my newsletter, you saw it's uh, this week is the 100th anniversary of the premiere of Rhapsody in Blue. And we're going to be looking at a couple different versions of Rhapsody in Blue. Uh, and first of all, try to see which ones I, which one I might want to work with of the, uh, of the scores that I didn't create, and then of the one that I did create, uh, well, I also have a choice to make there. So let's flip over to MuseScore.com for a moment. When I do a search on Rhapsody in Blue, you get all sorts of hits, right? You get pages and pages of results, right? Tons of results. And it's really hard to know which of these might be particularly useful, right? It's just, it, 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 it's next to impossible to know that, really. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is first do a little just guesswork. So one thing that we'll see is that by default on MuseScore.com, it's going to search, it's going to sort these uh, based on relevance, whatever that means, right? I don't know what that means. Um, and yes, happy uh, Valentine's to to all uh, as well. Um, so I don't know exactly what relevance means. We could sort by rating. We could sort by uh, the number of views, right? Uh, th these are all things we could... Uh, um, did I? Oh gosh, 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 gosh! I'm I have, I'm not screen sharing. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's make sure I'm screen sharing. That would be very useful, wouldn't it? Screen share, silly me. Hit screen share button. Screen share button. Sorry about that. All right, now you're seeing my screen. All right, so yes, tons and tons of search results for Rhapsody in Blue that by default search on relevance, whatever that is. I have no idea what that really means. Um, but I'm going to go with it, uh, and I'm going to assume that the algorithm is telling me something useful. Uh, whether it's really useful or not, I don't know. But we're just gonna we're just gonna go on faith for now. Uh, I'm just resizing the chat a little bit. Um, so uh, I'm going to favor the things on the first page of search results because it seems to think they're the most relevant. I think it's favoring ones that do have a lot of votes. 
uh, and a lot of views and high ratings. I think it's doing that. Now, Stephen is making a really good point about the official scores. And let's talk about that for a second. I do like the idea of the official scores. When you see official scores here, what this means is that the actual publisher uh, submitted this. Chances are the publisher created it in some other software. They then exported it to Music XML. It then got imported into MuseScore and then posted. Some of those got some cleanup. Some of them might not have. So you can generally count on the official scores to be accurate musically, but they will often require quite a bit of cleanup. And so actually we'll, we'll take a look at one of those and, and see. But check this out. This is an easy piano edition. I don't, I don't want that. First of all, my my goal here is I'm, I'm less interested in the piano arrangements in it of it than I am in the arrangements that are faithful to say the original 1924 arrangement. There was also a later arrangement from the 30s for a somewhat larger orchestra. Um, so that is one of the things that you'll want to look at. And if we if we look at this right here, uh, let me actually just uh, shrink this down so I can see multiple things at once a little better. There we go. And all right, good. Um, a lot of these are arrangements for different kinds of ensembles. This one here is for clarinet and piano, right? This one here is a piano solo version. There's This is for a trombone quartet. This is a big band arrangement here, right? I mean, so there's all sorts of different versions of it. And some of them, like the Gordon Goodwin version, I, I know I've seen that before. We've, I've, got, I've seen the score. Uh, and it's... Uh, I mean, it's it's the same tunes, but it's it's a totally different arrangement. It's not just reorchestrated. It's a totally different arrangement. And so how would you know this, right? Um, you, you have to do a little research to know that. So um, there's all these things to, um, to sort of be juggling. Then there's just the matter of paying attention to who uploaded it, who uploaded it. There are certain people who... I often see their scores here, and I've come to learn are typically pretty good. Like this person here. I don't know who this person is, but when I see HMS Comp, I, I generally have a pretty good idea that it's a decent version of things. Another particularly interesting one is this one here from Mark Pierce, which I had already seen when I clicked on it that this was specifically created with the intent of creating a Braille conversion. So I feel like it's a promising version. And then this one here from Jessica Lewis uh, got a lot of votes and a lot of five-star ratings. And when I check it out, it also looks pretty good, right? So there's that whole process of understanding uh, what's going on. And then you can just read their descriptions here and see if in their description they say something like, uh, you know, I I worked from the original score and did blah, blah, blah. Um, it doesn't look like Jessica put in much in the way of description, but you can read the comments and see uh, that things uh, were generally well done. Uh, Mark Pierce's version, he specifically says it's a transcription from the 1924 edition. He scanned uh, this, you know, so he, he scanned this and HHP Music. This is a uh, Haipeng Hu, who is the main person uh, doing uh, Braille translations, uh, Braille uh, versions of music. So this version here, I feel like if it's not already perfect or as good as it's going to be, this is a great starting point. All right, um, so what I've done is I've already loaded that into MuseScore, and we're going to take a look at it here. So we're going to look at Mark Pierce's version here, and we're going to talk about what might need cleanup and what might not. So um, when I look at it, I see a number of things about it that I'm like, yeah... Let me uh, get this um, also positioned where I can see chat with it. There we go. Um, 
so when I look at this one here, you know, I, I don't know what I'm looking for, but it looks pretty good. I don't see a lot of weird things. And sometimes the weird things could just be because it was done in an older version that didn't translate. But I do notice things like this, this hairpin that he has angled up to, uh, um, you know, to follow the, the contour of that glissando. And I'm not saying that that's wrong to do, but it's it's definitely a quirky thing to do, right? I mean, yeah, sometimes we do that uh, to save space, but I'm not convinced it really bought anything here. Uh, so it's the sort of thing that makes me go, hmm, all right? So that's uh, what I will say about that. Um, I'm not going to make any changes to this yet because I want to keep kind of hunting around and seeing what else I see. Now, when you're working with a big score like this, you've got a lot of scrolling around to do. So I'm definitely using my touchpad extensively. I'm looking for things like, do these slurs look like they've been, um, you know, messed with a lot? Things like this here, I believe, are cues. I think it's showing... Oh, I see. It's trombones one and two combined onto one staff. Trombone one is playing that line. Trombone two is resting. So there's another decision to make. MuseScore does support that. It does support combining uh, parts onto one staff like this and then generating individual parts for it. But it does create a little extra work and a little extra attention to how you enter the parts. Because if you want to combine two parts, trombone one and trombone two on the same staff, you have to do it with multiple voices and you have to do it consistently. Even if both parts have the same exact notes or have the same exact rhythms with different pitches, you still have to use multiple voices for that facility to work. So I'm going to kind of scroll through here and see if it looks so I can already yeah, so here he does look like he's using multiple voices there, which is good. Um, I'm wondering if I'm going to find places. Well, no, it looks like he's doing good things, right? He is, in fact, um, using multiple voices, even in places like this measure here where you don't have to, right? These could have been combined into one voice. So I'm happy with what uh, he is doing here as far as that goes. Uh, I see funny looking things like the way this triplet here is and these uh, dynamic markings. I have a feeling that's something that just didn't come over very well from MuseScore 3. So that's the kind of thing I'm also going to be interested in possibly cleaning up some. So hopefully just me talking through what I'm seeing here is giving you an idea of the kinds of things that I'm talking about. So let's talk about actually doing some of these uh, adjustments here. Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning and look at the horns because I almost decided, oh, look, he's not doing what I want him to do with the horns. Uh, notice that he has the horns with multiple voices here, but then in this passage here, they're combined. Right? So, the thing is that horns are, this is, this is like important stuff, I guess, to know. Uh, it's very common when producing scores for large ensembles to combine uh, trombone one, trombone two, trumpet one, trumpet two, clarinet one, clarinet two, you know, same with flute, oboe, bassoon, the instruments that typically have two different parts to combine them onto one staff. Horns have their own special thing. And I don't know if we have any horn players here or just people who have studied orchestration enough to give me a better sense of what I'm about to tell you. What is very common for horns is that we're going to have two staves for horns and two of the horns are going to be combined on the top staff and two of the horns are going to be combined on the bottom staff. And very typically they're written, it says horns one and three and then horns two and four. The four horns are usually split this way, right? Um, uh, horns one and three at the top, horns two and four at the bottom. And this is, there's sort of a historical reasons for this, but the thing to know is that horn players typically either specialize in high notes or they don't. 
and they have mouthpieces that are set up to let them play high notes or not. So the horn one and three players are your high note people, your horns two and four are your not so much high note people, and so that's just the way they're organized. I don't know why they don't set it up as one, two, three, four. There's some, oh, because if you only have two horn players, you still want it to be horn one and horn two. So, but if you have four horn players, you let horns one and three double and they will play the same line, but sometimes they will split into separate lines. So knowing how horns are laid out, this is all uh, you know stuff that you learn about in orchestration, but what I'm interested in here is how he has laid this out here. The horn players are actually going to be used to reading. Like I said that for trombone, we're actually, well, I didn't actually say this, but I will now. Even though the horns, the trombones are combined onto one staff in the score, they will get separate parts eventually. Uh, the horns won't. The horns one and three are going to read off a part that says horns one and three because it is going to be unison for a good chunk of the time typically. This isn't typical because there's only three horns and I'm not sure what uh, what Gershwin was doing. Actually Gershwin didn't do the orchestration, uh, Ferdé Griffé did. I don't know how you pronounce names. but. Um, Grafe uh, is the one who did the uh, orchestration here. So all these places where we see things written not in multiple voices here, because they're horns, and this is going to be um, uh, print, it's, it's going to all be on one part. We're not going to separate this into separate parts. It's okay that those aren't in separate voices. So I'm not going to worry about that. But I'm going to just do another quick scan just to see what else I see that might require some attention. And, um, yeah, I see, I see basically good stuff. So I'm just going to start fixing some of those things, and then we'll move on and talk about other things. So what I'm going to do first is, uh, see, I already forget. Oh, oh, oh here's one thing right here. Um, check out the sizes of these text markings. So I already said I'm not crazy about the way that hairpin is angled. So I'm just going to reset it. I'm just going to select it and press Control R, select that dynamic and press Control R. Now, when I selected that dynamic and press Control R, I expected it to align with that hairpin, and it didn't. And so now I have to wonder why not. Why? Because MuseScore will normally align uh, a dynamic that occurs right after a hairpin. I suspect that this hairpin is one note short. So I'm going to select that endpoint, and I'm going to press Shift Left to shorten it, Shift Right, Shift Right again. No? What is going on here? Um, why? So I'm wondering, if I just reset that and reset this, why they aren't aligning. So this is something now I get to worry about. What is going on here that caused them not to align? Oh, I know exactly what it is. I know exactly what it is. Remember, this was angled before. If I go to the Properties panel, see, he had previously checked the Allow Diagonal Box. That Allow Diagonal Box is what allowed that hairpin to be angled, right? Without it, it wouldn't be allowed to be angled. Well, when you have angled hairpins, MuseScore won't try to align the dynamics anymore because it assumes, okay, he's playing games here. I'm just going to let him play his game. So when I press Control-R to reset that diagonal, it reset it to straight, but it still is allowed to be diagonal. I have to uncheck that. Now that I've unchecked it, MuseScore will align that dynamic. This is, okay, I am going to take the blame for this. I implemented some of that in MuseScore 3, right when MuseScore 3 came out, uh, when we were first figuring out how to get the alignment between the dynamics and the hairpins. Um, uh, it was partially implemented. I completed that implementation, but then realized, oh, diagonals, it's going to not work to do it. So I'll have allow diagonal disable the automatic alignment made sense at the time, but then the fact that when you reset it, it leaves allow diagonal still checked. You could call that a bug because uh, maybe control R should have reset that property also. But in any case, now we know something to look for. So there was an interesting little uh, tidbit of things to learn. Now, one of the things that I'm noticing here is wildly different 
text sizes, right? Solo here versus Gliss here, uh, and then tiny little solo here. So this is like um, not so hot, right? Um, so uh, yeah, this is, um, I, I, I wanna clean this up. Now, by the way, about the, the those Forzando uh, markings, I'm gonna guess that uh, Gershwin didn't put them in his piano score, which is what I assume your link is here. Your link here is probably to the piano version, right? His manuscript piano. And so the manuscript piano isn't gonna have certain markings that really are meant for wind instruments, right? Because it wouldn't make sense. Uh, so certain types of articulation, certain things you will expect to not find in the piano manuscript. Uh, yeah, the fact that it's taking as long as it is to load tells me, yeah, this is the uh, piano. It's it's fascinating to look at this, by the way. Um, uh, let me just jump to where it starts here. Um, so this is actually Gershwin's handwriting here. Um, this is presumably what Groffet uh, was working from. And I wish I knew how to pronounce his name. I wish I knew how to pronounce a lot of things. Um, uh, by the way, someone else asked about the trill and why why this is notated as a half note tied to a quarter, there's another strong possibility. The original manuscript appears like the trill should only be on the half note and then maybe stop. So, right, so that you stop trilling on beat three. The original manuscript says that, but most of the published scores don't. They show the trill line extending all the way over. In fact, if we look at the actual published sheet music, which I do have up here. Uh, is that it? No. Uh, I do have the published sheet music. Um, mm, 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 mm. Right here. And it shows the trill line. So this is actually the official published sheet music that Gershwin had a hand in this arrangement. And it shows the trill line actually extending over beat three. I have my doubts about whether that's really most appropriate or correct, but in any case, that's another thing going on. All right, so um, yeah, and notice, by the way, there's no crescendo written in the original piano version. This is this is the duo piano version, and it says piano solo because there's also the accompaniment part. This is the solo piano version. The solo piano version also doesn't have the hairpin, but presumably the original orchestra version did. So um, I'm I'm not liking all those little things that I saw, you know, that angled hairpin just seemed weird. I'm not liking these text things also. So what I want to do is I want to try to reset some of that text business, all right? Let me get my uh, chat back. Uh, 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 uh. I got to remember how I'm doing things here. Sorry, I know this is disorienting when you all see this kind of stuff going on. You square cafe, that's it right there. All right. So, um, so I've reset that thing, but now I'm interested in fixing the font on or fixing the font settings here because they're they're kind of all over the place. It looks like he added the word solo here as staff text, but then made it bigger. He added Gliss here as expression text, which is a different type of text. Um, and he added it um, because it's he wanted it italic, uh, which, you know, I'm going to assume that that is the way it was in the score. Jazz band and piano is indeed how it's mentioned, but it is, it's not, it's, it's the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. So it was a combination jazz band and uh, strings. So, it, it, you know, it's his own sort of unique thing. The Paul Whiteman Orchestra is what it was originally written for. So... <coughs> I want to fix this. So what, what I'm going to notice here is if I click the word solo and look at the properties panel, I see the size is 14.43 point font. I mean, where did that come from? Probably some weirdness in importing from an older version, but I want to get rid of all that. So what I'm going to do, if, if I come here and just press Control R, Control R is usually that kind of reset command. It didn't do anything. I'm sorry it's not showing you my keystrokes right now. It, it just gives up on that at some point. Um, Control R doesn't do that. I'm going to have to go through here and reset things individually. 
except I don't. But that's what I would have to do. I would have to click that thing and then reset that, reset, you know, look at all the settings in here and reset them. But I'm going to undo that change and I'm going to try something else. I'm going to right click the word solo and then say select similar. Now it's selecting all the staff texts throughout the score, including that little bitty one down here, which is probably the default size, although we'll, we'll find out later. And I'm going to try another command. Under the Format menu, Reset Text Style Overrides. This will reset some of the things that Control-R didn't. So it didn't reset that one. So what happens is, and this is... This is another one of these complicated things to have to learn, and that's why we're doing this. That this is this is a detail session, right? <laughs> this is all about details. Oh, it did it. It just took its time. All right, never mind. Because it because there were hundreds of those texts that had to update. So good, it did it. Reset textile overrides did what I wanted it to do. Now I do though want to tell you what I was starting to say. Uh, when you're editing text. If you want to change the font of this, there's two ways of doing it. One is to select all the characters and then change the font here in the properties panel, right? And then you can and that's very useful if you want to if you have like a whole sentence and you just want to make one word bigger or one word bold, right? So by selecting like I could just take the letter O here and make it tiny. Right? Not that I want to, right? But that's I can do that, right? Um, so that idea is, uh, is where you're actually editing the text. You've got the little box around it, and you've got a cursor, and you select some letters, and then you change the size in here. That's good for individual letters, individual words. But if you want to set the entire text element to be bigger or smaller, don't be editing it. Just click it. So we're not editing it, right? We don't have a little box. We don't have a cursor. And now make the change. And now it applies to the whole element together. And that's different than applying it to all the characters within it. Does that make any sense? It's one thing to say the word, the whole text element is now bigger versus all the letters within it are individually bigger. Don't do that other thing. Don't do that second thing. When you're changing the size of text, don't double click it and select it. Just single click it and make the change there. MuseScore 3 had two totally different places to do that, right? If you selected text, selected characters, you had a toolbar down there where you made the adjustments. But if you weren't editing the text, you had the inspector over here where you made those adjustments. MuseScore 4 improves this by giving you the same place to do it, but it's still possible to create weirdnesses there. So I'm going, what reset text over, textile overrides does is just sort of undoes the latter things. It does, it, 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 re, it, re, it resets those things and kind of cleans it up. So that's a useful cleanup command to know. All right, now the word gliss here. Yeah, we're getting in all sorts of like randomly interesting topics. At least they're interesting to me, and I, but they're good topics to know about. The word gliss here, notice it's in italics and it's above the staff. So this, I'm going to assume again that he's working from the actual score because he says he was. And if it was italics and above the staff in the original, then I will assume that's the case now. But I want you to know about a general distinction that uh, music editors typically make. All right. Um, there is what's called technical instructions and there's what's called uh, expression. Uh, expressive instructions. Technical instructions versus expressive. Technical instructions are things like solo. This is like the stuff that is black and white. It tells you only one person should play it and it should be, so even if you have a whole clarinet section, only one person should play it and it says you got the melody all by yourself. I mean it's a very black and white thing. The, the, the phrase pizzicato is similar, right? If you Pizzicato means pluck the string. There's, it, there's, not subje there's no subjectivity about it. Or mute for trumpets, or con sordino to use the Italian term. You put a mute in, right? It's a very specific thing to do. So those are called technical instructions. 
things like dolce, sweetly, you know, cantabile, the song-like, right? All these, all these terms that say something about the emotional content of the music, that's what's called expressive text. The tradition is technical instructions go in plain font above the staff, expressive things go in uh, italics below the staff. The idea is that the expressive things kind of are like dynamics, even though they're not literally dynamic, so they kind of are designed to go below. They, they're designed to show up in the same place as the dynamics and to kind of look like dynamics and to kind of blend in with the dynamics. Uh, but the technical stuff goes above the staff, not in uh, italics. So what we have here with the word gliss is some of each, right? Uh, it's entered as italics, but it's above the staff. So it kind of looks like it's uh, expressive text because it's italics, but it's above the staff, like uh, um, uh, technical text would typically be. Um, this gliss is not gliss is not expressive. It is a technical instruction. So this should be. Uh, a technical instruction. So I'm using the term technical and expressive, but now let's talk about the actual muse score terms. Staff text, expressive text. So this was entered as expression, and that's control E is the shortcut. Or if you go to the palettes, you'll see uh, under text, you have staff text and you have expression text, right? Two different types of text you can add. So um, he added this as expression text, but it's not expression text. It is really technical instruction. So now I'm getting really picky, but why not, right? I'm, I, I want to, we got to, we're here to learn some things and this is something to learn. This is how I would recommend doing this. I would take that, delete it, re-enter it as staff text, which is how you're supposed to do technical instructions, or control T, I use the palette because it was there, but control T, and I will enter gliss, and then I will leave no, I will leave text node there so it's still selected, and then I will come over to properties and say I want it italic. So it is technical instruction, it's above the staff where it belongs, I'm making it italic, not because it's the right thing to do, but because presumably that's how it was in the original, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to be faithful to the original, but also be musically correct. Musically, that is an adverb. Um, correct as far as how it was entered into MuseScore so that it will get exported to Music XML properly and everything else will work properly. Um, one other thing, by the way, to, to know about that gliss is, yes, the original versions of it all have the gliss written out, right? Normally, though, a gliss, you don't write out all the notes. You just use the gliss symbol from the palette, but that's not what Gershwin did. He wrote it out in notes. And the story goes, and I, I think this is one of the true stories, uh, is because uh, there's all sorts of legends about the creation of uh, the, the composition and original performance of Rhapsody in Blue, but I think this is a true story. The clarinet player, as kind of a joke during rehearsal, did the and made it that big, dramatic uh, bend gliss as a joke. And Gershwin laughed and said, I love it, keep it, do it on the gig. So, uh, but what he wrote, what Gershwin wrote was the scale, like you see there. But no one plays it that way because the, the original person on it decided it would sound better as a bend. Gershwin agreed, and then they just wrote in the word gliss and said, okay, now from now on it's a gliss, uh, meaning uh, specifically a bend type of gliss. And when I played clarinet in high school, I used to love trying to reproduce that and just seeing how long I could bend that, uh, you know, because you really can't bend all the way across the break on a clarinet. The break happens between A and B. So you can't really bend across there. But once you get around to that B, you can start bending. So you got to kind of finger everything up to the B, and then you can kind of bend from there. But you can use half fingers on the notes and so forth and kind of get a bendy sound the whole way up. And so I used to practice see how smooth I could make that thing bend. It was fun.
All right. What else can we look at here? Um, all right. This right here, what is this little line here? A glissando? Is that for real? I'm not buying it. Uh, I don't know if that was there originally. So here is where if I really want to do some cleanup, I need to have the actual score to work from, and I don't. I don't have this. Somewhere or other, I do have a copy of that PDF. Um, but, in fact, let me let me see. I did do a search on it. Let me, uh, nah. let me just try another search and see if I can find that somewhere. Because when I, when I did my string quartet arrangement, I researched, and even though it wasn't public domain yet, I did manage to find a PDF of the original 1924 version. It's public domain now, but it wasn't when I did my string quartet version. And I'm going to turn over to that in a minute, too, and just talk about some of the ugliness that's happened there. Uh, all right, this is going to not be happy, so I'm not going to worry about it. Close you. So I'm not sure what that, that little gliss there is about. I suspect that was really a slur and it got misinterpreted as a gliss um, because it da -da, da -da -da -da. maybe it is maybe it is meant to be one it's just it, it's really hard to say uh, without seeing the original um, clearly the piano version isn't going to show you can't I mean it, 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 maybe he intended the clarinet player to bend there I don't know um, but I'm not going to worry about some things like right now I look at this tenuto marking that's kind of crashing into this slur so I'm going to make a distinction here. If my only goal is cleaning this up for print purposes, then I probably want to manually adjust that. What I really want to do is, is make sure that in some future version of MuseScore, they're better about these collisions. That is one. Uh, collisions of things with slurs are the hardest thing in MuseScore because the way it does its collision avoidance is based on kind of like putting rectangles around things and avoiding making sure the rectang rectangles don't clash. But for slurs, because their shape is so big, it, it does it by creating a whole bunch of little rectangles and then seeing what's crashing. And it, it, it gets complicated. Oh, sorry, it's tie, not slur, but same, same algorithm. Um, and so anyhow, the algorithm for avoiding collisions with slurs and ties is kind of a hack and it, it it has in it little buglets like this where things will crash into each other so what i want to do is i am going to adjust that because i do want this to look good for print but i also want to make sure i do it in a way that's not you know going to cause any other problems so what i'm going to just do is just press the up arrow which moves it like one tenth of a staff space at a time some elements some types of elements, the up arrow goes a half a staff space at a time. Some of them, it goes a tenth of a staff space at a time. And I never know which until I do it. When in doubt, come over to the properties panel and look at the appearance. And as I raise this, we'll see the offset is going to change, except it's not. Oh, that's because I accidentally clicked leading space. Let, let's unset that. Unset my leading space. So now I've got, let me redo this. Click the Tenuto, click Appearance, but make sure the score, make sure the uh, focus is in the score, and now start pressing up arrow, and you can see the number updating in real time here. Sometimes they don't update in real time, uh, but it is here, and you can see it's going a tenth of a staff space at a time. Negative numbers means up. That's the way uh, everything's measured from, from the top of the score pointing down. So this was the default position, zero offset, but I'm just going up one uh, notch, creates just a little separation, and I might be good with just that much and say, you know what, that's good. But notice by using the arrow, I guaranteed it, I didn't move it sideways at all because I don't want to move it sideways. I could have come over to the properties panel and made that same adjustment here using the spin box there. Um, but in any case, I like to make those changes cleanly making sure I don't which is why I didn't drag it so I don't want to drag something to adjust it because if I even if I just try to drag it vertically I might be off and I might accidentally drag it horizontally also but in fact in your score I'm gonna reset that if you drag and press shift while dragging it won't let you go sideways Notice that I'm trying to drag sideways and it's not letting me. Shift will constrain your drag to only vertical. Control 
and you have to like click it and then press control. Now I can drag sideways but not vertically. So shift will force drags to be vertical, control will force drags to be horizontal. I don't tend to use that because I'd much rather just use the keyboard and the keyboard also gives me nice clean numbers like a tenth of a staff space not 14.31 or whatever that font size was before. Why does that matter? Well it matters for reproducibility, right? If I want to then have that same passage happen somewhere else and I want to make the same adjustment, I don't want it to be some 0.314 adjustment. I want it to be 0.1. I want it to be something you know, a, a nice round number. Not, round numbers look good, but they they look good on paper just to see the number, but they also make it easier to reproduce the same thing. If I know that I took this tenuto marking and went up arrow once, I now know I can make that exact same adjustment here. Select that tenuto marking and press up arrow once, right? And I can use that same exact uh, adjustment in other places. So when I talk about doing things cleanly and cleaning up. These are the kinds of things that I mean. And there's every score is going to have different things, right? I'm not saying that what I'm finding in this score is, uh, oh my God, what is that? I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I'm not saying that what I find in this score is representative of what all scores are going to have in them, but uh, it's you know, it's every score is going to teach you something different, which is one reason we're going to keep returning to this topic over the coming months. So you see what I said? Oh, my God, what is that? There's like this weird invisible key signature change right here in the clarinet part. So there's two possible things that are going on here. Uh, I'm... Uh, hedging because I don't know exactly what's happening. I'm, I want to hear a B and find out if it's going to play that B. What is this? And here's a return to C major here. So something has really gone weird in those couple of measures. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I, so I don't know what's happening. I got to find out. I'll tell you one thing is there were bugs in MuseScore 3 especially earlier on, like MuseScore 3.1, 3.2, where uh, key signatures would sort of randomly appear in your score like this. And uh, we fixed the bug that caused that to happen. However, scores that were already infected with these key signatures uh, wouldn't be fixed. And so I'm going to try to fix it now. Um, what I'm probably going to find is if I try to select that key signature and delete it, hey, it did work. All right, good. So one mystery there. I don't know why it was there, why that invisible key. Oh! Mm. Here's a thought. Here's a thought. Uh, another, another nice lesson to learn. Check out what's going on here in that melody. Uh, let me play this on piano. Um, that line, I know what that line should sound like. Um, this is actually transposed, so I'm going to play it in concert pitch, right? It that trill, that little trill is supposed to be up to a B flat, but MuseScore three didn't know how to do. So yeah, this is what he did. So don't do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm so glad this came up. Um, MuseScore up until MuseScore, I think four point one was the first version that, that did this right. Up until then, so all versions of MuseScore 1, 2, 3, and the original MuseScore 4 didn't know how to do accidentals in trills. It didn't know how to do, didn't know how to make that A trill up to a B flat. Again, that's transposed. It's if you're if you've got perfect pitch and going, that's not A and B flat. It's really G and A flat concert pitch. So that's what I'm playing here. Um, so MuseScore up until MuseScore 4.1 didn't know how to do accidentals on trills, and people used all sorts of crazy workarounds to get around that, and including adding invisible key signatures which would then because what MuseScore would do is it would obey the key signature and pick whatever note, whatever upper note fits the key. It would do that. Some people would put an invisible note 
in another voice earlier in the measure, right? Um, some people would put an invisible B flat earlier in the measure, and that would also trick the trill into doing the right thing. Well, that is no longer necessary. And then you would, and then people would add a flat sign as a symbol and drag it into position so that it looked right. Or there was a way of some version, depending on the ornament, there would be a way of adding an ornament directly to the, uh, adding an accidental directly to the ornament. None of that stuff is necessary anymore. So let's talk about the right way to do this now. I'm going to delete that crazy key signature because it doesn't belong there. And now you'll see that that flat sign appears automatically. Um, well, that's because, uh, if I play this, let's play it. Let's, let's hear. All right, well, it's struggling to keep up a little bit, and it's quiet because my volume is too quiet. But let's uh, try that again. So it's not doing a full-on trill because it's a, a short little uh, passage there. Um, but in any case, MuseScore, as of 4.1, has this cool business where you can now say exactly what you want that interval to be and how you want that uh, accidental to show up. And so uh, it's showing up automatically because MuseScore was already playing it correctly before I deleted that key signature because the key signature hack was how you needed to do it in MuseScore 3, as Michael is observing. Um, so as soon as I deleted the key signature, MuseScore already knows, hey, he wanted that trill to be a half step, so I'll set it correctly now and it automatically showed the flat sign. So if you want to add your own trill, the way you'll do it now is you'll come over to the palettes and find the ornaments palette uh, around here and add your little trill line and then select that trill line and then in the properties panel is where you can select what you want the interval to be. So automatic is diatonic, but you can say, no, I want a minor second and then it automatically plays it as a minor second and displays the accidental you can also say hey uh always display an accidental or you know so you you there's different settings there so that's another one of these things that you're going to want to uh um uh you're, you're going to want to clean up here is if you've got older scores that that use these crazy workarounds for things like uh playback of trills we can get rid of that Michael, I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you make the three notes in the trill even? Oh, do you mean like as a triplet? Uh, like that? No, you can't fine tune the playback of the trill at that level. That's, you know, a common request, and someday I'm sure that feature will exist. In MuseScore 3, you could kind of sort of use the panel roll to do it, but it didn't work very well. Um, and so they're looking for a better way of giving you customization over things like trills, uh, um, grace notes, and so forth to be able to fine tune playback of those things. So yeah, so cleaning up of accidentals is absolutely part of that process. Um, so yeah, one thing that I will say about this is now that I've got these trills written in with the flats, that's I'm sure the way it was in the score. Um, in fact, if we look back at the piano score, we can see that right there, right? But da -da -da -da. Oh, he only put the flat on the first one. <laughs> look at that. He only put the flat on the first one because he's kind of going on the assumption that someone's going to be like, well, I just played that A flat, so the other two must be A flat also. So if I wanted to reproduce that, I could do that. I could select this other trill and come over here and say default accidental availability, always display... Hmm, is there not a way to say don't display it at all? Or can I select just the accidental and press V? I don't actually know this. This is a new enough feature that um, that doesn't look like I can. That's curious. It doesn't look like there's a way to not show the thing. Show any alteration. I'll just display an accidental and default. So maybe someone else knows if there's a way to not show that accidental. I'm not saying we should do that. I think that was... That's being pretty presumptuous to assume that just because the there was an A flat on the first trill that the others should also be A flat. Yes, accidentals carry through the measure, but does that really apply to ornaments? Eh, I'm not so sure. I would rather be safe than sorry and just include that flat sign. So now let's talk about what our goal is here. 
is our goal accurate reproduction of what we see on the page only? Is it accurate playback only? Or is it musical correctness so that it will translate to Braille properly only? Well, Probably it's some combination of all three of those things. You want it to look like the original, but you also want it to play reasonably, but you also want it to export to Music XML and therefore to Braille and other formats correctly. So you kind of have to balance these different considerations. Um, and for my money, uh, there is no advantage in going out of my way to hide that flat sign. I don't feel like that's going to, it's not going to improve the playback. It's not going to improve the Braille. And I don't care if it doesn't look exactly like the original because it looks at least as correct as the original. That's my personal call on this. Um, someone else could certainly uh, argue otherwise. But it does kind of um, surprise me that there's not a way to hide it does surprise me, would be a reasonable feature request. Now, if you really cared about that, we could take this one and press V to hide the entire ornament and then add another trill. And on the new trill, uh, oh gosh, now it's showing a natural sign because of that flat sign earlier. Wow, I don't know. If, you know, I might play games to see if I could oh, show any. Alt. Yeah, I don't know if there's, I don't know how I would get that to work. Uh, it's so interesting. Um, yeah, so in MuseCore 3, you can make it invisible, but then you have all those other problems that you had to, you had to do of the invisible key signature. We, so the thing is, we don't want that invisible key signature because that invisible key signature is going to export to Music XML and it's going to confuse the Braille process. So we don't want to have to rely on hacks like invisible elements any more than we need to if we care about things other than uh, just how it looks on the page or just the playback. We want to balance all three of these things. And relying on hacks like invisible things will do when we need to, but uh, we're, you know, it's not, not my go-to. So, um, in any case, you know, I was going to try to do an invisible thing of hiding that trill and putting in a new trill that didn't show an accidental and see if I could do something reasonable. And yeah, there's probably some way of doing it. There's probably some way of pulling it off, but I ain't got to worry about it because again, my goal is clean up here and I'm balancing those different uh, um, considerations, playback, visible, you know, the actual engraving, and then the export. And to me, this is the best balance right here. So for my purposes, this is the cleanup I want. I'm done. I don't want to hide those accidentals because I feel like that adds nothing other than uh, quirky adherence to whatever engraver happened to leave the flat signs out of this version. So um, that's my call. Uh, so uh, yes, all sorts of things that you get to play with in dealing with these uh, imports. I said I wanted to look at my version, and I do, but I'm not going to try to clean it up, but I just want to show you uh, a kind of a maybe a worse case scenario. Uh, if I come over, oh, by the way, if I go to where the score is, oops, that's not it. Hold on. Sorry, wrong, wrong window. Um, Rhapsody in Blue, Sheet Music Search Results, if I go to my search results here and I want to find my own version, which is for string quartet, this version here was created in MuseScore 1. And it's pretty impressive that I was able to create this arrangement using MuseScore 1, but it required all sorts of hacks, all sorts of hacks. And so notice by the way, this has been a thing for like the last month or so, edit on desktop. It's really kind of a cool little button. Press that, and it's, it's got, for some reason, it doesn't remember this. You'd think it would know how to use cookies and not keep telling me I need to download MuseScore. I've already downloaded MuseScore. I don't need to see that dialog. Just ignore that dialog, right? Um, but uh, it is now basically downloading this score for me and opening it up in MuseScore, and here it comes. 
And that doesn't only work for my own scores. That is how I got uh, the score we were just looking at. I never downloaded it manually. I just clicked edit in desktop and it just opens up. It downloads it automatically, pops it into MuseScore, and there it is ready for me to edit or play with or do whatever I want. Now, if I save it, it's going to, if I go to save any changes now, it is going to say, hey, where do you want to save, save these? And then, you know, you'll have to save it locally on your computer. But um, in any case, it's a great little feature uh, that was just added to MuseScore.com recently. So this is a version that was created in MuseScore 1. Now, did I ever update it? If I go to Project Properties, it shows that this file was actually created in 2020. So I believe I did update this version. I originally created it in 2020, but you can see here where it says MuseScore version 3.5.2. So even though I originally created it in MuseScore 1, I did, back in 2020, update it for to use 3.5.2. So I already did a lot of cleanup on it, but I also know I didn't go crazy with it. Uh, I just ran out of steam and just said, you know what, I'm just going to like make a, some basic changes, but uh, I just didn't worry about a lot of things. So this is my string quartet version, and you'll see things like, uh, this, he, so this, I use this symbol instead of the trill symbol. Um, and I don't remember if that's because a version I worked from used that symbol instead of the trill symbol or because I thought it was going to play back more the way I wanted it to. Um, so no, edit on desktop, I was saying, is, is available to ev everything. That's how I got Mark Pierce's version. So any, any score that's downloadable at all, you'll also see edit on desktop. But when you go to save it, it will save to your computer. It's not going to update their version. You can't edit. You can't literally edit other people's online versions. You're just you're basically working with your own local copy, but it manages it all that for you. So yeah, this business here, obviously I use this little symbol here probably to get that triplet playback. Let's hear. Well, it didn't really do triplets exactly, but it was maybe a little bit closer. So uh, because it Muse score 3.5.2 didn't have the, uh, the ability to put those accidentals up there, uh, it thinks that these are naturals, and I didn't play those games of using the invisible key signature to fix the playback because I didn't care. Um, and so what I would have to do now is come over to properties and say, no, 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 I really do mean a minor second, and it will add the flat there. I really do mean minor second, right? Um, yeah, I'm really surprised there's not a way to just hide that accidental. Um, oh, look at that. This accidental... Huh. If I select the accidental, it did let me select it. Okay, so you know that's the thing? I must have just misclicked because now I can hide that. Let's go back to my other score and see if I just misclicked. That's possible. Um, or it could be that mordants work differently than trills as far as that goes. So let's find this and see if I just zoom in a little better. Maybe I can click the accidental. No, I think trills must be special. And it just won't let me select the accidental for some reason on the trill. Maybe because it's a line. Trills are lines, right? They can extend over multiple notes. Mordants are single note articulation, you know, markings, ornament markings, but, you know, single note things. And so maybe it doesn't let you hide the accidental on lines. That could be the, the limitation here. I don't know. Anyhow, um, Coming back to my string quartet version, uh, because I already did a bunch of the cleanup, it doesn't look as ugly as it otherwise would. The original version probably had all sorts of other uglinesses that I'm not seeing in here, but I think I did a reasonably good job. Now, this score has all sorts of key changes that um, only last for a few bars. If I was arranging this myself, I wouldn't notate every single key change just because for a few bars it visits a different key. Um, Gershwin really did that a lot, um, and it, it feels dated now. Um, but I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to change Gershwin's notation or, or Graffet's notation for that matter. Um, oh, yeah, so let's talk about those, uh, uh, just those forzandos uh, before I wrap up because that came up. Um, 
the thing is, even if those were there in the original, they looked ugly, right? I did not like the look of them. So I want to find where they were, and though there's no magic find command, I just have to find them. Wasn't it in a passage like this? Huh. Yeah, here it is. So, yeah, this, so what I'm complaining about here isn't the mere existence of the Tforsandas. It's that uh, it's weirdly interfering with the triplet bracket, right? Weirdly interfering with the triplet bracket, and really only on that part. But, yeah, this part here, it looks like this got adjusted also. So one of the things you have to do is decide to what extent you just want to start with a clean slate. The older the score is, the more I'm going to want to do this. But what I, if the score is pretty ugly, I'm likely to just want to do the following. I'm going to do Control A to select all, and so I'm literally selecting the entire score, every single thing in it, and then I'm going to say Control R. Um, because this is a big score and I've got a whole bunch of stuff open, did I not? Yeah, no. Uh, so yeah, I'm sorry. I just control A to select all and s control A to select all is a slow operation on a big score. But there we go. Now control R to reset literally everything. And that's going to fix some things like this weirdly offset triplet bracket here. Um, but you know, I'm sure Mark Pierce did some really good manual adjustments of some things, but uh, yeah, it, it changed a whole lot of stuff, probably not for the better. But um, but it does make those triplet brackets look better, right? So instead of resetting everything, if you think that the person did a good job of manually adjusting things, you could just reset individual triplets, individual measures, individual passages, whatever. But yeah, I would do that. I would I would get in the habit of resetting some things to get a clean slate for things like those triplets, so that they uh, they just look better by default. They look better reset than they did with all the manual adjustments done before. Part of that's because the manual adjustments may or not have been very good, but part of it is because the manual adjustments done in MuseScore 3 don't translate over to MuseScore 4 perfectly. So often, if you're importing an older version, reset is going to be an especially good idea. All right, so we got into a lot of details here, right? A lot of nitty-gritty details of a lot of stuff. And I knew that was kind of the uh, what we were going to be dealing with with this this uh, this particular session. Uh, but we got to look at a lot of different aspects of MuseScore, and hopefully people found some of this useful. And, yeah, we're going to return to this type of theme maybe on a smaller, more manageable score in the future. But, um yeah, this is the the, uh, the kind of thing that you all really want to know about how to create clean scores and perhaps clean up other scores that you download. So, I will thank everyone for being here and uh, get my chat back so I can see uh, what people are saying here. But I uh, appreciate everyone being here, appreciate the comments, appreciate... Uh, yeah, all the thoughts about what's going on. And tomorrow we'll be uh, continuing our look at Rhapsody in Blue musically. I'm just going to talk about more aspects of it musically. By all means, feel free to be checking it out yourself and, and participate in the discussion. Give your own insights. Ask your own questions based on what you see. But yeah, we're going to be digging into the piece a little bit more and uh, just kind of talking about uh, what makes Rap Rhapsody in Blue tick. If you're a gold level member, uh, earlier today I posted a, uh, a link to my version, my string quartet version on musicore.com as well as my recording on YouTube. You can find those both also yourself. And talked a little bit about my use of improvisation, how I decided to improvise some places, not necessarily the same places that Gershwin did, but in the same spirit. And so that's Part of what maybe we'll talk about a little bit tomorrow also is the role of improvisation in the original and how that's sort of been lost over the years because once they publish the score, people stop improvising with it because they're like, oh, well, now there's notes. i got to play them. But that's not how Gershwin did it, right? And that's not what I did. So we'll talk about that, among other things, tomorrow. Hope to see you then. Bye, everyone.